in the first video of the boundaries of the educational imagination we went from one school outwards to all the schools of the world and then in the second chapter in the second video we went from one school inside of it taking a look at how classrooms desks and chairs and writing equipment have worked in schools over the last 200 years now we're going to jump from a school into the mind and I suppose one of the ways you can picture it is uh, we were working in video two right at the end with the equipment we use to actually teach and learn and on the one side that's really paper uh, but a paper fiber in its kind of microscopic detail is very different to a neuron firing uh, the one's uh, dead it's matted over the other one is alive and electric um, and what I'd like to do initially is just start off by a simple expansion of how we work all the way from a synapse, which is a connection between two neurons, outwards into, well, you can see the synapse at the bottom left, and now what you have is you have a connection between two neurons, and then you expand outwards from that to the connections building up towards the different parts of the brain, and that of course the brain is not on its own the brain is hooked into all sorts of ways into our bodies and our bodies are the spectacular uh, creature which we know as man or as human and I would say man and woman together now although that gives you some kind of an insight into how you would expand uh, from the smallest to the largest inside our physicality, inside our being for education, it doesn't help us that much in terms of education in its own terms. And really the question we should ask is what's the smallest unit inside the brain that we would use which would help us educationally speaking, purely in terms of education. And over there I want to suggest that the place we start off is with working memory. And I find working memory to be a fascinating concept because, number one, it is so limited. It can only hold a couple of things in mind for a couple of seconds and then it fades out. But everything has to go through that channel that we actually learn. So really, at the heart of the brain's functioning is working memory in terms of of education and it results in all sorts of profound insights into how education works and I'd like to start off talking about that by making a distinction in total working memory capacity between on the one side what's called the intrinsic load now the intrinsic load is the actual difficulty of the task at the time that you are doing in its own terms so for example if you're doing calculus it's the actual task of calculus that you're doing the actual calculation uh, what you've got to bear in mind, if you're a total boff or expert in calculus, it's going to be quite a, a simple intrinsic load. And if you're a beginner in calculus, it's going to be very difficult. And I'll talk to that later. But I'm just saying that the intrinsic load varies depending on how you're good you are in the topic itself. The second kind of load is extraneous load. Now that's the load that gets taken on in working memory by the instructional design choices you make to teach it. Now we, we know from experience that sometimes what can happen is the actual topic that you're trying to learn can be very simply and elegantly presented by your instructional design choices which illuminate the intrinsic load. But other times the extraneous load can be something which is heavy, unimportant, a waste of time, distracts you from the actual task at hand, gives you extra things to do which actually don't count, often in the hope of increasing your interest. Uh, and almost they're saying, we're trying to increase your interest in these things because we actually don't think the actual topic is very interesting in its own terms. So really you've got to work at reducing extraneous load or being very careful with how you work with it to make sure that uh, more space is left in the limited working memory capacity for the intrinsic load. Now the third load is a fascinating kind of load and that's called germane load. And that has to do with the amount of working memory taken up with actually thinking about the intrinsic task that you're doing. Making sense of the task. And we know from research 
the more sense you make of the topic in its own terms, the more you can actually place it within long-term memory because you want to move from working memory into long-term memory for all the things which are important and worthwhile. And one of the ways that happens is by actually thinking about it, making sense of it, and actually placing it within bigger webbed structures. Now that gives you a really tight and first crucial account of the smallest working part in our brains that is relevant to education, or so I would argue. And how does that play out then in terms of education itself? Well, the first thing we've got to bear in mind when we talk about it is that your working memory actually has two incoming points. It has visual information on the one side and auditory information on the other side. And that's why I'm doing this video series, because at the same time that you're listening to me speaking the auditory information, you are also getting a visual picture of what it is that I'm trying to talk about. And what we know from research in brain science is that you, if you use these two channels together, you actually increase the capacity of working memory. It is very limited. Working memory is very limited. But you can increase its capacity by using both visual and auditory information at the same time. And that's why I'm hoping that this video series really works better than a book or better than just listening to a, a teacher teaching this stuff. Uh, and the crucial po point about that is from working memory, that then goes into long-term memory where it's permanently stored in a networked kind of a way. Now, the capacity of long-term memory is unlimited you can get more and more and more stuff in there and the more stuff you've got in there and the more linked it is the more sense you can make of the stuff in working memory that's why you often find people who are experts in their field remember new facts about that field quickly and easily because they have a structure to place it in so really the question about education at this level is how do we get things in working memory to find a place, a space within long-term structures. And that means that we have to work out how to build those long-term structures. Now, uh, to do that, there's a first kind of situation we're going to explain when trying to ensure that you limit the amount of extra work which uh, working memory must do. And interestingly enough, the first thing that you can do if you're a novice, if you're a first timer working in a situation, is to not tell the person who's doing the task what the actual end goal of the task is whilst they're doing the task. You might say so beforehand, but in the process of doing the task, exclude the goal from the problem. Allow the student to do the problem in its own terms. Not try to think, why am I doing the problem to solve the goal? If you do that, what you're doing is you're taking working memory away from the problem, focusing on the problem itself. And that means that the student lands up in a situation where because they're not devoting their attention to the problem, they don't give as much working memory to the situation as possible. So strangely enough, uh, if you want the learner to make sense of something and they're a novice, don't assume that you have to give them the goal and hold the goal there all the time for the learner. You don't. And often it is damaging to do so because it takes up a limited working memory space. The second thing you can do when working on a problem is to make sure that what you do for the students is you give them a worked example which actually shows them what the steps of the sequence are so that they can actually pay attention to the problem steps, the sequence of the steps and how to solve it. If you just give them a problem and say to them, listen, you try and solve it, what happens is so much working memory gets taken up trying to work out what the problem is, how to solve it, that the student cannot pay attention to the structure of the problem itself. And if you firstly give them a worked example where they can understand the structure simply, you can then move on to a situation where what you do is you start to take away certain elements of the problem. And over here you can see what's happened is I've taken away F2 and G 
And in that situation, you get the student to start solving problems. You want them to solve problems. You want them to make meaning. You want them to make sense. But you want to do it in a way which is structured and graded, which goes from them knowing what a simple step solution is to starting to work out certain parts of the sequence themselves. So you're not wanting to force feed the kids. But you do want to get into a situation where you structure the difficulty process so that working memory is given enough space to work on the problem itself. So the third thing you don't do because working memory space is limited is you don't give the student on one page all sorts of different bits of information to solve a problem. You don't give them A and B and C and D and E and F all circulating around the page and say to the student, why don't you make meaning and sense of that? In some ways, it could work because it's interesting and it tries to get the student to make sense of it. And we know that germane load is a good thing. Thinking about things is a good thing. But there's good ways to get students to think about things and bad ways. And to overload their working memory with all sorts of input can actually confuse what the problem is. Rather, give them the problem, make them think about it, but be very careful about the elements you give them to solve the problem. Now, the next issue, and it's a similar issue, is don't try and give them uh, six different examples of the same problem. So over here you see I've got a situation where you have a problem and there's A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, A6. That's six different quotes on the same problem written in different ways but dealing with the same issue in the same way. It's going to waste a student's time. Rather choose one that is really good and effective and catches what the problem is and only give the student that one because that will mean that they can focus on it in their working memory. So that is why when I started the third chapter of this book and the question of the third chapter is what is the smallest element that we work with inside the brain in terms of education and I'm saying I think it's working memory and you can see why it does such productive things in terms of advice on how education works. Now the whole intention behind working memory is to get stuff into long-term memory and to do that what actually happens is there's this wonderful process which is called chunking uh, and that's not vomiting uh, chunking is a situation where instead of remembering little bits each in their own right and remember we can only kind of work with three or four bits at a time what happens is you take four bits and you put them into a pattern and you remember the pattern instead of the bit. So now you can remember four or five patterns, not four or five bits. And that's what experts do. Experts are in a situation where what they've done is they've put the little bits that they're working with into patterns and then they've actually taken the small patterns and they've put them into bigger patterns and then when they are thinking, they seem to be working at super speed. And the reason why they seem to be doing that is because they're not working with little bits. They're working with uh, super patterns, each of which have got hundreds of bits in organized ways synthesized inside of that. And that is our task in education in part, is to make sure that our students start to chunk the information into meaningful patterns which hold together in bigger and bigger organizational sets. Um, and for those of you that in any way are involved in uh, the sociology of knowledge, you'll know that when we talk about hierarchical knowledge structures and horizontal knowledge structures, in both of those we're still talking about a situation where you have to make meaning of bigger and bigger and bigger sets of information which you chunk systematically. So when thinking about how it is that we're going to expand from the smallest element inside the brain to the largest element inside the brain in terms of education. I don't want you to imagine it moving from a synapse uh, to a neuron to parts of the brain to how the brain works in the body. I think that's interesting. I think that's important. But in terms of education, the place that you start is really with how we operate in working memory
that's the smallest zone of learning that we have to work with, this micro little space, which is only open and holds for uh, seconds and can only hold a couple of things in it in that time. That's the smallest space that we focus on in education. That's where we start theorizing and thinking about how education actually works. And then strangely what happens from that small limited space is, is that you have massive expansion possible into long-term memory and the networks that it builds up and the structures that it builds up. And the educational question is how we move from working memory into long-term memory and how we build the structures in long-term memory to become more systematic, more networked, more linked, so that it grows and grows and grows over the lifetime of a learner, enabling them to move from a novice position where they're only focusing on little bits to an expert position where the whole field happens as this wonderful set of big patterns which contain within themselves all the other elements in complex and connected ways.